there are two separate parts of your brain I'd like to speak with today. First, I want to talk to the part that makes decisions on who to vote for, how much insurance you should put on your car, and deals with how not paying taxes sends you to jail. We'll call this part of your brain Kevin. The rest of your brain can kick back, especially the parts that knows what kind of gas station you prefer, whether Lena Dunham is awesome or the most awesome, whether a certain sports team is the winningest, or believes that you can leave a casino with more money than you went in with. We will call this other part Other Kevin, in honor of Dave Willis. Okay, Kevin, you're up. I'm going to cut to the gut punch, Kevin. Between you and me, it is my displeasure to inform you that science fiction has ruined Other Kevin. Just like comic books have compromised their ability to judge the likelihood of acquiring heat vision, science fiction has messed up their sense of scale about interstellar travel. But you already knew that. Not like other Kevin. You're the smart one. In the immortal words of Douglas Adams, space is big. But when he said that, Douglas was really understating how mind-bogglingly big space is. The nearest star is 4.3 light years away. That means that light traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second would still need 4.3 years to reach the nearest star. The fastest spacecraft ever launched by humans would need tens of thousands of years to make that trip. But science fiction encourages us to think it's possible. Kirk and Spock zip from world to world with a warp drive violating the prime directive, right in its smug little Roddenberry and face. Han and Chewie can make the Kessel Run in only 12 parsecs, which is confusing and requires fan theories to resolve the cognitive space distance dissonance. And Galactica, the SDF-3, and Guild Navigators all participate in the folding of space. And science fiction knows everything that's about to happen, right? Like uh, cell phones? Additionally, Kevin, I know what you're thinking, and I'm not going to tear into Lucas on this. It's too easy, and my ilk do it a little too often. Plus, I'm saving it up for Abrams. Sorry, Kevin, got a little distracted there. The point is, science fiction is doing colossal hand-waving. They're glossing over key obstacles like the laws of physics. So stay with me here. This isn't like jaywalking bylaws that probably don't apply to you at this very moment. They are the physical laws of the universe that will deliver a complete junk kicking if you try and pretend they're not impressed in crushing your little atmosphere requiring century lifespan conventional propulsion drive dreams. So let's say that we wanted to actually send a spacecraft to another star whilst obeying the laws of physics. We'll set the bar super low. We're not talking about massive cruise ships filled with tourists seeking the delights of the super fun zone planetoid Itchy and Scratch Landia Prime. I'm not talking about sending a crack team of power armored space marines to defend colonists from xenomorphs or perhaps taking more thorough measures. No, I'm talking about getting an operational teeny robotic spacecraft from Earth to Alpha Centauri. The fastest spacecraft we've ever launched is New Horizons. It's currently traveling at 14 kilometers per second. It would take this peppy little probe vet 100,000 years to get to the nearest star. This is mostly due to our lack of reality shattering propulsion. Our best propellant option is an ion engine used by NASA's Dawn spacecraft. Now, according to much adored Ian Handsome O'Neill from Discovery Space, we'd be looking at 19,000 years to get to Alpha Centauri if we used an ion engine and added a gravitational assist from the sun. Just think of what we could do with those 81,000 years we'd be saving. I'm going to learn the dulcimer. So we can start shearing back the reality curtain and throw money and resources to chase nearby speculative propulsion tech. Things like antimatter engines or even dropping nuclear bombs out the back of a spacecraft. The best idea in the hopper is to use solar sails, like the Planetary Society's light sail. Use the light from the sun as well as powerful lasers to accelerate the craft. But if we're going to start down that road, we could also send microscopic light sail spacecraft, which are much easier to accelerate. So once these mini probes reach their target, they could link up and form a communications relay or even robotic factories. Sorry, I think that was my other Kevin talking. So where are we at for reals? 
Harold Sonny White, a researcher with NASA, announced that they've been testing out a futuristic technology called an EM drive. They've detected a very slight thrust in their equipment that might mean it could be possible to maybe push a spacecraft in space without having to expel propellant, like a chemical rocket or an ion drive. What's that, Kevin? Yes, you should be totally skeptical. You're right. That last bit was a salad of weasel words. Even if this crazy drive actually works, it still needs to obey the laws of physics. You can't go faster than the speed of light, and you would need a remarkable source of energy to power the reactor. Also, yes, Kevin, you're right. NASA is working on a warp drive. There's no need to yell. NASA is also working on an actual warp drive concept known as now Kubier Drive. And it would actually do what science fiction has claimed to warp space to allow faster than light travel. But by working on it, I mean they've done a lot of fancy math. But once they get all the math done, they can just go build it, right? Well, this concept is so theoretical that physicists are still arguing whether powering an Alcubierre drive would take more energy than contained within the entire universe, which I think we can call that an obstacle. Oh, one more thing, other Kevin, thanks for being so patient. Here's your reward. Unicorns are real, and Kevin has been lying to you this whole time. Go get him, tiger. So place your bets. When do you think we'll send our first probe towards another star? Predict the departure date in the comments below. Thanks for watching with your Kevins. Never miss an episode by clicking subscribe. And our Patreon community is the reason these shows happen. We'd like to thank Choo Choo and Brett Simon and the rest of the members who support us in making great space astronomy content. Members get advanced access to episodes, extras, contests, and other shenanigans with Jay, myself, and the rest of the team. Want to get on the action? Click here. Oh no. Oh no. You didn't record? I wonder where it stopped.